back for another video. My name is Adrian Lee. You know me as the Wandering Art Historian. And if you're wondering what's going on here, uh, you're right. It's a whole new environment and it's a whole new format. And why is that? That is because this is a brand new web series. And I am so excited to finally be able to share this with you. It's called How to Read a Movie. And how exciting is that? Who doesn't love movies? I love movies. You love movies. Let's talk about them. Um, if this title sounds at all familiar to you, which I hope it does, it's because it's kind of connected to a previous web series that I did many moons ago titled How to Read a Painting. If you remember from that web series, we talk about colors, symbols and the stories as they uh, pertain to famous paintings, right? We talk about how artists use color symbols and stories almost like clues and how we have to become the art historical detectives to figure out what's the meaning behind these famous works of art. Well, we're going to do all of that, but with film. How exciting is that? I am thrilled. And you may have notice that I use the term we to talk about the films that we're going to discuss. That's because this isn't a lecture. This is a conversation. So every video I will be having a guest cinephile join me to discuss a different film. And I just wanted to say welcome to our guest cinephile, Denise Leonard. Hi, how are you? Thank you for being a part of this. Oh, thank you for asking me. I'm honored. I'm very, very honored. You know, let's get to know Denise a little <laughs> bit more. Um, I send out a questionnaire to all of my guest cinephiles and their <laughs> answers are amazing. I'm sure Citizen Kane is great, but Denise <laughs> believes the greatest movie ever made is The Shining. I gotta say, she makes an excellent point. Um, three films that best describe her cinematic tastes are Star Wars, The Godfather, and Us, three amazing, holy smokes. Um, and then the film everyone loves but she hates is La La Land. And this is a statement I can definitely get behind. All right, so now that we know who our guest cinephile is, let's discover what our film is. <gasps> The Village, directed by the incredible M. Night Shyamalan. This was released in 2004. I'm going to say what everyone's thinking. You're doing an M. Night Shyamalan movie. How dare you? But guess what? I like M. Night Shyamalan. I know he has had a few missteps over the years, but I don't really care. Um, what I think is super <laughs> cool is that this particular film, The Village, is being talked about a lot lately and some of those reasons will probably come up in our conversation today um but before we go too too far you, you have to know spoiler alert right i mean first of all if you haven't seen the village well you need to pause the video go watch it real quick and then come right back because nothing is off the table we're going to talk about characters we're going to talk about plot points and we're definitely going to give away the ending okay so you have been warned. Now, um, as I mentioned, I love this movie. I think it's an amazing cast. I think this movie keeps, keeps you guessing like at every turn. And of course, you cannot talk about an M. Night Shyamalan film without talking about color because dude, it's, you have to like, first of all, the color like everything is very muted, like browns and greens and stuff like that, of course, um, throughout the film, but two really important colors jump out almost from the beginning. Denise, what were your thoughts on these two colors? Well, I feel these are extremely important colors. He sets the tone very early on from the opening scene where you see the funeral, that everything is muted. Um, he gives a very clear time period um, and what the mood is in this village. 
But then you have these two amazing colors that you start to slowly learn about and learn how important they are. I feel they're so important that you could almost consider them a character in the movie. They are a big part of keeping the storytelling going and keeping us guessing. Um, so for the examples are the yellow, um, which is this bright kind of mustery yellow. And if you think about the time that this movie is set in, that would have been a hard color to make. Um, there would have been a lot of, you know, dyings of this color to make it as bright and as noticeable um, compared to their other clothing that they wear. Um, and then of course we have the red um, with two contrasting different opinions, um, yellow being for innocence, uh, safety, um, and then you have the red, which is used for danger um, and the unknown um, warnings. Um, so those were the two main colors that really jump out at you right from the get-go in the start of the movie. Uh, yeah, I gotta say I wholeheartedly agree. Um, Shyamalan is so masterful that he lets us know we have to like keep track of these colors throughout the film yeah. because they help tell the story. I love this image that you found um, mm -hmm. of Lucius played expertly by Joaquin Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. come on, of course. <laughs> In this, like, like you said, it's safe and innocent color, but then he's come across this bush covered in like the danger color and it's like, what a beautiful contrast. There's a lot of really cool shots where those colors are like juxtaposed. Um, and it's interesting because you brought up a fascinating point about how hard it would have been to come up with the dye for that yellow. But mm. red, we find it in nature in this film in surprising ways, like the berries. Do you want to talk about like, because that's some cool symbolism, if you ask me, these, these Dern berries that we would take for granted, but it's such a shocking moment in the film. What were your thoughts on the berries? Yes, the berries are so interesting because um, you do see them quite early on. And it was funny, I was out walking my dog today and I walked up my pathway and my holly tree has now, for the first day, popped out red berries. And I was like, oh my goodness, morning, morning, the bad color. Um, so it's, it's interesting how he took something that you see every day um, while you're over a walk. And these people live in a wooded community. So clearly the red is going to be all around them. Um, but you also get a sense when you see it is dread and that the characters beautifully, it's such a well-performed movie that they, the reaction to the red color makes you have fear um, and it makes you think something bad is coming. And usually after you see the red, right around the corner, there's gonna be consequences and something terrible is happening. Uh, yeah, for sure. I think it's so interesting how we, the viewer, get sucked in, like we belong to this community because we're trying to figure it out. So that's just brilliant writing. Um, what I think is so interesting, you pointed out that their response to this color is, is to bury it, right? They're like supposed to yes. cover it up. Um, and I yes. think that's cool because <laughs> There's this scene later in the film uh, where Ivy, um, Bryce Dallas Howard's character, who of course mm. she's amazing, like. Amazing, oh my so, goodness, so amazing. How much do you love this character? Like, I love her, I just think she's amazing. So she's yeah. on this epic journey in the safe color, but she's also blind and she finds mm -hmm. her way in the middle of this seen surrounded by these berries. How, how did that make you feel when, when that happens in the film? It's a brilliant moment because it is such a good example of how, fe how the color is a character. It heightened the fear of this simple shot. I mean, it's not a complicated shot. You're looking down on Ivy and then it pans and you see all of the red around her. And up until that point, we saw little pieces of red. You saw a branch, a little berry, um, you know, the swipe on the door. You saw tiny glances of the red but now all of a sudden she is in a field of red so you know you're at the height of the scary in this movie you know 
you know, it's gonna come good versus evil is right around the corner. Um, warning, warning, warning is what this shot is screaming at you. And it's just beautiful. Absolutely. I, oh, I'm on board 110%. I love the fact that at this point, um, it's kind of for us, the viewer, right? Because mm. he doesn't see the berries because she's blind and she knows right. the secret of the community that these creatures yes. that haunt them and stalk them um, aren't real, actually. Mm -hmm. But still, us, the viewer, we start freaking out because Shyamalan has told us this is the scary color. This is, like you said, yes. it's the warning color. So that's so cool that he's kind of including us, the viewer, in the telling of this story. Um, we have this amazing, you found this incredible image where it's like Ivy and she she's blind, but she senses the so-called mm -hmm. creature nearby. And we already mentioned that there are so many cool juxtapositions of the colors, the safe versus the warning color. What did you notice about this particular scene that really got you? What I noticed the most about this scene is that one, we were already now told that the monsters were not real. So now all of a sudden we have a threat and we've seen red, 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 red up to this point. So we know now this is good versus evil, but now we're confused again. Now we have questions, but M. Night was clearly telling us, hey, look in another direction. I have told you these monsters aren't real. So he's trying to set us up for something. Um, but again, we're still confused. And in true M. Night, we know that there's going to be a twist uh, right around the corner. He never lets us get too comfortable in his movies. So I love this image of Ivy where she can't see, but she can, can you imagine the fear of being in that tree hearing what you thought was a lie and is now you know that there's real danger there. You hear it snorting, you hear it breathing. Um, I'm sure she can sense the color that she talks about, you know, where she sees a good color when she sees Lucius. I'm sure there is some kind of danger warning for her. Um, so it, the intense level at this point is pretty, pretty high. And like I said, you never ever know what's coming around a corner uh, in an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Expertly said. And like, the, and to me, that's part of the appeal. Like it doesn't have to be like a, a, an amazing, like, I don't know, the, you're right. The reveal is so good, but the fact that he's challenging us, he's like, you know what's what the truth is, but you're still freaking out, aren't you? Like, oh, so, so good, so yeah. good. Um, a couple, um, before we move on to repeated stories, I just wanted to toss in there a couple of really cool symbols that I saw. Um, and a lot of it has to do with like, the first thing is, again, playing on our fears, this idea that Ivy's given the bag of magic rocks, like, she knows she doesn't need the magic rocks because her dad just confided that the creatures aren't real and she just has to follow the river, right? So you're like, well, then who the heck are these magic rocks for? Mm -hmm. And it's for the dudes so that they don't freak out, but they still freak out. Like their fear is bigger than anything that's supposed to comfort or protect them. And to the point where the one guy <laughs> makes me laugh every time, uh, the one guy says, why have we never heard of these magic rocks before? And you're like, oh, yeah, he kind of caught a little trip up in the whole scheme, the whole illusion. And you pointed out what happens when the two boys abandon her. What does Ivy do with the rocks? Yeah, she clearly dumps those out immediately. She does not need it. She is driven by something different. Um, and yeah, she just drops them on the ground. You're useless to me. Let's, let's get this job done. <laughs> that is so, so profound to me. Like, she's like, yeah, I don't need this. Um, I also thought, I know this is a little bit on the nose. Anytime you use a clock or a watch or whatever, I don't care. I still like it. Um, Ivy gets, she's on her journey to retrieve medicines from the towns and um, 
she climbs over this wall and to get the medicines, she has to pay for them. So she has this pocket watch given to her by her father. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, I get that it's kind of a, a nod to, you know, she's running out of time, literally. She has to get the medicines back to Lucius before he dies. Um, but she's also a woman who is out of time because she is living in a in the illusion that she's in a completely different century. So I thought that was kind of a cool um, symbolism duality or whatever. Um, yeah. A two for, yeah. if you will. It's a two for one on the symbolism. I love, I also love her outreached hands uh, when she's holding the clock that was clearly also um more symbolism throughout that movie is her outreached hands um holding the clock and then while there she's covering the berries um she doesn't want to see the color that shall not the bad color she wants to cover it immediately and she's very quick as soon as she finds out that bad color is on her hand she covers it very very quickly just like the girls at the start of the movie when they're sweeping off the porch and all of a sudden they come across the red flower run to the yard burying it um it's a very symbolism for you know out of sight out of mind um and then once you find out the ending looking back you realize that's exactly what they are <laughs> trying to tell you in the story um because they're taking everyone they love and taking them to to this village, um, burying them away from all the hardships, all the sorrow, all the bad things that are happening in the world. Um, so it very, Shamla was very good at symbolizing that. You, I thought anyway. you are brilliant. And that brings us to our discussion of repeated stories because mm. you're absolutely right. The act of the burying of the color so that it is not seen is a great parallel to the act of they're like squirreling their family away from the yeah. greater world. So that leads me to ask you, so like on the surface, of course, M. Night Shyamalan, right? It's always one thing on the surface and something else going on underneath. So on the surface, yeah. you're like, oh, it's just a, a scary woods, you know, stay away from the <laughs> woods. Um, so that's part of it. But you could also say, oh, it's your typical boogeyman you know it's the boogie you gotta fear the boogeyman the you fear the unknown fine but you touched on something that i think is really interesting the act of like trying to protect something that you love so much that you actually almost do it a disservice right because mm, yeah. doesn't lucius say he he picks up that something's not right right and he even confronts his mom played by Sigourney Weaver who is the queen of course um where he says you know uh there are secrets in every corner of this community and then we get this reveal of these black boxes and mm -hmm. their contents so so Denise then what is this movie really about it's not just the scary woods and it's not just the scary boogeyman. What is this about? No, of course. And I mean, especially in Shyamalan's movies, you're not ever just going to be about that. Um, for me, what screams at me while I'm watching this movie is fear and more importantly, being controlled by fear. Um, and you can, you know, I, when I started writing notes for our discussion, I was thinking how big of a part fear plays in my own life. And I was thinking from the time you are a little kid, when you are running around the pool and you should be walking and your mom says, hey, don't run or you're gonna fall and split your head open. You could clearly just say, don't run, those are the rules, but you have to add or you're gonna fall and split your head open. It's just such, I think, such a natural thing for us to do because we know how controlling fear can be. And I mean, just seriously take a stop and just I just thought for about five to ten minutes how where the fear is in my life and and when I first watched this movie I don't think I could relate to the elders at all and then when I look deeper into it I'm like this is his first movie post 9-11 so up until this point uh M. Night has been wrapping his 
you know, his surprises always keeps us guessing, but his surprises were kind of with a happy bow around the ending. You get like the sixth sense when you get Cole, um, he is now able to deal with this fear that he has been living with. You look at signs, um, Graham is now back to his faith, um, where something terrible happened to me and he lost his connection with God and then now he's back. Um, and then you can even look at like a different type of movie where he did Unbreakable. Um, and you can say David learned how to channel, you know, his superpowers to save the world. So you usually had a happy ending. But with this fear one, I found so interesting because the elders have a clear conversation at the end um, where I believe it's August. He even says early on in the movie, which was should have gave us a big clue. You can run from sorrow, but sorrow will find you. And then again, at the end, he starts talking about, you know, I did have something terrible happen to me in the real world, but the rest of my family has died here in the village. So clearly we can't run and escape sorrow. It's going to find us no matter what. So they are presented with evidence proving that the lie that they are continuing maybe shouldn't be upheld, but then they decide to. They still continue to control with fear. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's because of exactly what you just said, why we're talking about it more in 2021, this particular film, mm -hmm. because we're living in the midst of a global pandemic in the United States. Mm -hmm. We're experiencing a lot of uh, political turmoil and division um, so we've got some big traumatic events that are happening to us and we have to decide how we're going to cope with that. And this movie is offering us the different coping mechanisms, not all of them positive. And I think that's such yeah. a good observation on the fear. And so then that leads me to this amazing image of mm, I yes. Bryce Dallas, Dallas Howard's character, because then you say, well, if it's not a horror film, if it's not a period mm. piece, what is yeah. this movie? And you and I were chatting and it kind of dawned on us both that it's, it's essentially a love story. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful love story. I just love it. And I think why this movie didn't do well when it first came out was because what we were used to from M. Night was scary, the supernatural in some type of form. And then all of a sudden he came out and told us the complete opposite. Hey, the supernatural is not true. It's not real. And we were, I think people, especially I was a horror fan myself. I was like, wait, what just happened? But again, like you were saying, now this movie has picked up such a huge new following because we can relate to it so much better. And especially in my older age now and with everything that's happening right now. But, but on the good side, I think this is a stunningly beautiful love story. And this image of Ivy is my favorite out of the whole movie. Um, it shows the yellow cloak, um, which is covered in mud. She has fallen in that big hole and she had to crawl her way out being blind. I mean, so I think it shows the yellow represents the innocence, the safety, and it's covered a bit. She's now knows the truth. She is now past the walls. She is headed into town. She is independent. Um, she has found love. The innocence is being covered over by the mud, but not completely. You still see parts of that, which I love. It's just a beautiful, beautiful image. And she did such a great job in this movie. I adore her. For sure. And same, um, wholeheartedly. Uh, I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I, and so I'm not, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> and that concludes our amazing discussion. Um, Denise, do you have any parting words or anything you want to say to our viewers as we wrap up our discussion of M. Night Shyamalan's The Village? Well, there is one quote that jumped out um, to me about this movie. Um, and I'm going to, it's uh, said by Ivy's dad. And it said, with one of them is saying, how could you have sent your daughter into the woods um, when she's blind? Why didn't you send someone else? And he says, she is more capable than most, most anyone in this village. And she, she is led by love, 
The world moves for love. It kneels before it in awe. <laughs> so the love story maybe, maybe wins in the end. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's amazing. The perfect, perfect quote. Thank you so much, Denise, for your Thank you. observations. I am so, so grateful you were willing to participate in this web series, How to Read a Movie. We just spent the most amazing time discussing this incredible <laughs> film. Um, hopefully you like this video. And if you do, hit that like button, leave a comment, share your thoughts with us, share this video with the other art historians and cinephiles in your life. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wandering Art Historian YouTube channel for more videos like this. Again, this is how to read a movie. My name is Adrian Lee. Thank you to our guest cinephile, Denise Leonard. And thank you to all of you for subscribing and watching these videos. That's it. I will see you next time. Bye.